am so excited to meet with my family today. Grab your Bibles, open them to Luke chapter 2, grab your pens, got some awesome stuff to write down. Father, let the Word of God this day take us all the way back to Bethlehem, but also let heaven come down and fill our hearts today. Let us meet with you this day. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, amen. amen. Luke chapter 2 verse 1 says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, not just Israel, but Turkey, Asia, Italy, Greece. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Luke was very precise to tell us the timeline. And everyone in the, in the nation of Israel went to their own town. It doesn't say that, but I'll explain that in a minute. To register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem, 68 miles away the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. So Joseph and Mary, almost assuredly, in fact, I'll show you, they were so poor, I can about guarantee you that they walked. So this is a pregnant woman, nine months pregnant, walking 68 miles. Advanced study question number one was a, a fairly tough question. It was that Israel was the only Roman territory where people were required to travel to the city of their ancestors to register instead of registering in the town where they lived. The Romans were very pragmatic people. So in Greece and in Turkey and Asia and Italy, they would just say, register right here where you live. And only in Israel, and the question was, what was King Herod's strategy in making this one change in the way the census was collected? Now, Herod was the sub-king. He answered to Caesar. So what happened was obvious. Now, I want to be very careful here that when I highlight Herod's intelligence. I'm not praising him. You can separate someone's morals from their intelligence. Hitler was one of the most evil people who ever lived, but Hitler was a brilliant strategist. You understand that I'm not admiring the man. I'm simply acknowledging he was a brilliant strategist. Herod the Great was one of the most depraved moral men who ever lived, but he was also a brilliant strategist. You tracking with me on this? So Herod the Great was a sub-king under Caesar. His whole life, and especially his position, depended on keeping Caesar happy. So he gets this order from Caesar, I want every single citizen registered and paying taxes, which greatly increases the money. And, and Herod knows the Jews are famous, that they hate the Romans, they hate taxes, and they're famous for rebelling. And he knows that if he sends Roman soldiers door to door to door, registering people to pay taxes, and every single door in Israel, there's these Roman soldiers with all their regalia and their heads and their spears and their swords, and they're banging on doors, as Roman soldiers do. In the name of Rome, you must register. In the name of Rome, you must pay taxes. He, Herod knows with the way the Israelite people are, there's going to be a lot of rebellion and a lot of, come on, somebody, blood. And that's going to cause a lot of trouble for Herod. So being a brilliant tactician, he says to the Romans, he says, listen, I want to make one small administrative change in the way we do a census in our country. As an expert, he comes up with this fascinating solution. Rather than register them where they live, let's order all the Jews to be registered according to their lineage. This does two things. First of all, for Jews... A registration according to lineage was the highest honor that could happen in your entire lifetime. In fact, for a Jew, an ancestral lineage only happened every one, two, or three generations. So if you're of the tribe of Gad, the tribe of Simeon, the tribe of Issachar, it's been a hundred years since there's been an ancestral lineage. And if you don't travel to Gad and get your name included in the lineage, it would be like you never existed. It would be like you wiped out your whole children's line. It'd be the worst curse to not be included. And not only that, but just the actual gathering together would be like the ultimate family reunion. Maybe you haven't lived in the territory of the other Gadites in a hundred years, but for this one time, all the Gadites and all the Simeonites are going to gather together, and the smaller tribes would gather in one place. The big tribes, Issachar and Judah, they would gather by clans because they're so big. And so this will be a big celebration. So by tying, watch this carefully, Herod was brilliant. He was evil, but he was brilliant. By tying the Roman census, the most hated thing, to an ancestral recording, the most honored thing, he made it almost impossible for the Jews to rebel against the census. 
But on top of that, the tumult of this mass movement of everybody, because because this was a very uh, agrarian society, people moved very rarely. But it had been, you know, thousands of years since they'd first settled in their territories. And they'd, they'd moved, and so half the population no longer lived where their original ancestry was. And so all of a sudden, now everybody has to go and find their original ancestry lands. And it's going to cause, if you look at this picture behind me, a lot of people are going to be with all this movement emotionally. What's the word? Anybody, anybody feel that word lately? Emotionally drained? So for people who aren't used to movement, half of the towns are ghost towns for a season and half the population is moving and you can't sell your business and your home and, and there's not as much food because farmers aren't planting because they're having to move around. And, and the t honor and there's excitement and tumult, you know, and excitement is fun, but excitement is exhausting. And then the tumult and people just don't have the emotional energy to rebel. Herod was smart and in a sense he won. And so the second question I gave you last week was, what are the parallels or similarities between what Mary and Joseph went through in the whole nation and what we're going through now in our pandemic? And there's four things. Number one, it was a once-in-a-lifetime event. People look at what we're going through and they say, wow, let's go back to 1918, the Spanish flu, to find something similar to what we're going through now. We're never going to forget this. Someone say, oh, my. <laughs> Number two, tremendous economic collapse. Number three, people are angry, complaining, and disoriented. And number four, people are really clinging closer to their family. All that is the background to two fascinating words in verse 5. Verse 5 says, he, Joseph, went there to Bethlehem to register. There should be a period there, but there's not. There's two words after register. What are the words? Now pause right there couple of things. First of all, the only one required to go was the head of the family. Now, generally, when you're betrothed, there was a 10 to 20 year age gap. So Mary's 13, 14. Joseph is 25, 35 years old. They probably barely knew each other. And it just wouldn't make sense for this 14 year old, nine month pregnant girl who you hardly know. Leave her with mama. Leave her with the midwives. She can barely walk. She's kind of waddling around. Why take her with you? And so what we have here is a picture, and they pull back behind the curtain in another picture, which is what the kingdom of God is all about. So in front of the curtain, you see evil winning. You see the Romans dominating the world with their iron fist. You see evil Herod with all his strategists, and everybody's life is disrupted, and he's so sneaky, and he won, and there's no rebellion, and everybody's being turned upside down and manipulated, and it's all so terrible. Then you pull back behind the curtain. And you see this little couple, Joseph and Mary, this innocuous, unknown little country hick couple way up there in North Nazareth. And you begin to look a little deeper in their life and say, let's take a moment and look at Joseph and Mary. First of all, there's been some good things happened in their life recently. I mean, Mary had the meeting with angel Gabriel, and then she had the powerful prophetic word from Elizabeth. And then she saw Zechariah's tongue be loosened up, miracle things. And Joseph, when Mary comes back, he, the angel meets with him and says, don't be afraid to take her what is it's of the Lord. All oh, that looks pretty good, right? But let's kind of look a little deeper. Joseph and Mary both grew up here in Nazareth, small town. All small towns, you know, everybody knows each other. And we know that Scripture tells us they're both very pure. Joseph was called a righteous man, this 25, 35-year-old man, always the, the, the young man that everybody else admired, the one people looked up to. Mary, she was so pure. The other girls just hate her. Why can't you be like Mary? Be sweet like Mary. Be on time like Mary. Do your jobs like Mary. And you know how sharp-tongued people, the happiest they ever are is when the pure one screws up. So pure little perfect Mary goes off to visit her cousin Elizabeth and comes back with a bump in her belly. Are they sad? They're happier than they've ever been. Oh, look at little Mary. Pure little Mary. You and Joseph played around a little bit before you went, or was it even Joseph's baby? Oh, sweet Mary ain't so pure anymore. And their home, which used to be such a pleasant refuge, has become a place of razor blade tongues. So Joseph could go or he could take Mary with him. Now, there's another reason you might take Mary with him, and I had to say this out loud because this is a fact, but it's a fact that just pains me so much. It's good for us to remember history. You know, 
women were forbidden to read the Torah. Doesn't that just break your heart? Let's don't ever forget that the first curse in the Bible, Genesis 3.16, was that because of the fall of, of, of Adam and Eve, men became bullies. They became dominant evil suppressors of women. And so that's a curse that Christ has broken. Someone say amen. amen. But Mary would have been forbidden to ever read a Torah. So as, as Joseph said, look, I'm going to take you with me. And they're traveling along the road. One thing Mary would not have known was that there's a promise in Micah 5 2 that every Jewish man would have known because Joseph would have read the Torah. In fact, you find out later in Matthew when Herod asked, where is the Messiah to be born? Every Jewish man knew that Micah 5, 2 said the Messiah must be born in Bethlehem. And Joseph knew that. So as they're traveling along the road, Joseph and Mary are starting to get to know each other. And Joseph gets to tell Mary, Mary, you know, it looks like the whole world's in turmoil. It looks like the Romans are winning. It looks like Herod has pulled the one up on us. But you know what? While all the world is torn asunder, God has a secret plan. And there's been a prophecy around for hundreds of years, Mary, that the Messiah, your child, my stepson, must be born in Bethlehem. And God did all of this just so we could travel to Bethlehem. The third thing that happened was this. Not only did God cause the whole world to be in turmoil so this couple would travel to Bethlehem, not only did he get them out of a razor blade tongue situation, but there's most likely they hardly knew each other. And this, this may be a small point, but in some ways it's a small point which becomes the biggest point. They were in a place of, uh, listen, that's not the best start to a marriage, that you don't know each other, and you find out your 20 years younger betrothed is pregnant by God. And an angel tells you you must marry her and you hardly know her. And how kind is it of God that God got them away from sharp tongues sent them to a place where no one knew them, and gave them a journey. Listen, you're walking nine months pregnant. You're only coming five, ten miles a day. That they had a time to bond, a time to get to know each other, and God cared that they become not just married, but they become friends. Someone say amen. That is the picture behind the curtain. You know, the pandemic's horrible. The pandemic's ugly. The pandemic's been a mess. But do you know that I've had... Over 30 times that Beth and I have counted, that people have come up to either Beth and I in the last six months in this church, and a few times we've had service, uh, two or three times every time we've had service during the week they've come, we've gotten emails, but when they come up to me personally, it's so funny because I'm wearing my mask, they wear theirs, but they have to get real close, and they say, can I tell you a secret? And they always whisper, and they say, I don't know if it's okay for me to say this. And I say, it's okay. I always know what they're going to say. They say, I, I don't want anyone else to hear this, but I got to tell you. in my life and they tell me these things that are just I have one lady last month that said to me she said she said this one was precious I mean people best jobs best family situations marriages restored I have one lady she said I'm a single mom and my son is 17 she said in the past five years I don't think well I've had 10 good conversations with my son she said and then she started crying she said we have 10 great conversations a week, every week. She said, my son has become my best friend. She said, I get out of bed every day and I drop to my knees and I thank God for this pandemic. She said, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> I said, you're allowed to say that, sister. God caused the whole world to be in a pandemic so you and your son could be restored. <laughs> So you see, so many times the world's in turmoil, and behind the curtain, God has these secret plans. He went there with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, who was expecting a child. While they were there, now, let's, let's say we read the Bible as if it was just straight word with no filtering. You with me on that? Okay, let's do that. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest available for them. Question number three. Why did Mary wrap the baby in cloths? The actual Greek word is strips of cloth. And why did she place him in a manger? Now, there is a separate Greek word for a blanket because some people, which is rather offensive to me, they take this and go, oh, that just means they swaddled them. Every woman knows if you have a choice to swaddle a child with one inch strips or a choice to swaddle a child with a blanket, you swaddle a child with a blanket, okay? So what happens here when we quit sterilizing the scriptures is this. They're in Bethlehem. 
Bethlehem because it's the city of David. Now, of all the cities that are going to be crowded, David's going to have a lot of ancestors, right? 20, 30,000 people are going to be related to David. So Bethlehem, which used to be a town of what, 150, 200, has gone in six months from a town of 150 to 200 to 20 to 30,000 people. So they have found a place in a barn or a cave where animals are kept. Question number one, is there any hay left? There isn't any hay for 10 miles. Question number two, how long has it been since this barn or cave has been cleaned? Normally, in a normal day, how much manure is on the ground? One to two inches. That's a normal barn. In this barn, which normally has three to five animals, now has 40 to 50 animals, how much manure is on the ground? One to two feet. And there's not a drop of hay within miles. And yet this is the only private and or sheltered place. And so she lays down and pushes the manure aside and gives birth to a baby. And then she has to clean the afterbirth off with a combination of dirt and manure. You clap away as much of the manure as you can and try to find dirt, which is more sanitary than manure. So she's rubbing dirt to clean the afterbirth off of baby Jesus. And then she has not a shawl. She has not a blanket. She has one piece of cloth to her name. She must maintain modesty. So she reaches down to this one strip of cloth that she owns, and she tears off small strips. Because she can't stand the thought of nothing. So she has two or three strips, an inch wide, 12 inches long, and she wraps them. Don't forget that this was so unusual for a baby to be wrapped in strips, not a blanket, and to be placed in a feeding trough, that the angel said to the shepherds, you're going to see something you've never seen before. A family who can't afford a blanket and who put their baby in a feeding trough, that's how you recognize the Messiah. We sterilize things, don't we? And then she has this baby. She wraps him in strips covered in blood and afterbirth and dirt. She can't stand the thought of laying him in the manure. So she finds the only thing that's off the ground, and that is the feeding trough. So she sticks him in the feeding trough. Did I twist the scripture at all? That's what it says. That is how God sent his son in the earth. A picture of he who came to bear our sins. Verse 8, and there were shepherds lying out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. Grab your pens. I have two words for you to write in your Bibles. They're good words. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them in the glory. Next to the word glory, write the word brightness. The word literally means brightness. You know, the heavens opened up, and if they weren't given supernatural eyes, it could have blinded them. The brightness of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll see something you've never seen before in your life. A family who can't afford a blanket for their child and putting their baby in a feeding trough. Verse 13, suddenly, grab your pens. This is a really important one. Circle in your Bibles a great company, where it says a great company of the heavenly hosts. And instead of great company in your Bibles, y'all going, why didn't I bring my Bible today, aren't you? Good, I hope you feel that way. You'll bring it next time. Next to great company, write the word fullness. Listen to me carefully. The word in the Greek literally is fullness. So here's what's happened. A few angels get to make this announcement. If you were in an angel and you've been waiting millennium for this prophecy and you watched God the Son shrink himself to a single cell and be implanted in a womb and you watched him gestate and now he's going to somehow take on man and redeem sins and you've heard these prophecies but Peter said even angels long to look into things. And now the Father has allowed the veil between heaven and earth to be peeked back. And some of your bros are, are getting, to, getting to talk to the shepherds about it. And you're just right behind them. And you're peeking over their shoulders. And then the Father says, okay, anybody who wants to sing a chorus, join in. If you're an angel, are you skipping that song? 
So the Bible says, now we don't know how many angels there are in heaven, but estimates are anywhere between two to six billion angels. Remember one angel, the Bible tells us, slew 180,000 people in one night. So the Bible says here that every single angel in heaven all of a sudden starts singing at the top of their lungs. Can you even imagine what that looked like for these shepherds? I'm almost terrified for them. And in just a few minutes when we close and we sing, Son of God loves pure light. At the end, I'm going to ask you to keep your hands up high. And I'm going to ask you to, as we close in prayer, here's the prayer we're going to pray. We're going to say, Lord, what happened in the natural, we now have in the spirit world. And heaven is open to us spiritually. And we receive that Jesus has opened the way to heaven. And we see in our spirits, not this world, but we see the heavenly world, which is our home. And we celebrate him this day who has brought us life. And we will see this picture in our spirits. That's how we celebrate Christmas. Suddenly, the fullness of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God. Two billion angels at the top of their lungs saying, glory to God in the highest heavens and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Question number four last week was this. Three reasons why the angels appeared to the shepherds. By the way, next week we're going to cover this. First John 5, 7, there must be three witnesses. There are three witnesses of Jesus coming. That first was John the Baptist who represented Elijah. Second are the shepherds. Next week we're covering Simeon and Anna. Fascinating how Simeon and Anna is a double a message of the third witness. We really want to study that in advance. But the shepherds, the shepherds, first of all, these are the very shepherds who watched the sheep who were sacrificed in the temple. The sheep who, when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. And these shepherds were despised and they were poor, but most of all, shepherds were known as tender. David was a shepherd. Jesus called himself the good shepherd. So Jesus didn't come as a conquering warrior. He came as a tender shepherd. But also question number five, I pointed out that the King James Version wrecked this, this translation. Listen to me. Look me in the eyes. Say out loud, don't be weird. Of course there's no one version of the Bible that's perfect. And of course when we say the Bible is the word of God, it's the original Greek and the original Hebrew. Don't get weird, okay? Every translation is a translation. It's the original Greek and the original Hebrew that's the, un, that's the perfect word of God, and there's going to be mistakes. So the King James says something's great, something's wrong. King James really botched this in the translation. The King James said, on earth, peace, goodwill to men. Jesus did not come on earth to bring peace, goodwill to men. Most versions say, peace to those on whom his favor rests. That's why we go back to the original language. But let's go on now to um, verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Just one thing, by the way. I hadn't said this in any other service, but it just occurred to me. It must have been a very humbling scene to see this young couple lying in manure with a baby with strips of cloth. And, and maybe only common laborer shepherds would believe that that's the Messiah. Maybe if they'd gone to rich people, they never would have believed that this filthy little couple in a, in a manure ridden. And when we close in prayer in just a couple of minutes, one of the things I want to say is not only did Jesus being born in a manure pile represent him coming to take on the sins of the world, but in this pandemic, some of us have been lying in manure and yet giving birth to some of the best things we've ever given birth to. And sometimes you have to lie on a pile of poop to have creativity. And so sometimes it's not such a bad thing to lie on a pile of poop. You have some of your most creative moments. So (laughs) that one was free. We're going to close with a question I'm going to ask you next week. Verse 19 says, Mary treasured and pondered. Next week in the middle of my sermon, I'm going to ask you to remember what the word pondered means. Because treasured and pondered are not synonyms. They are opposites. They are antonyms. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her hearts. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had told them. Treasured is a positive word. It means that everything that happened to Mary, she valued. She gave great weight. She honored God and committed all her heart to God. Pondered, if you have your Bibles, literally means clashed. The word means to battle. It's translated battle, if you want to jot that down in your Bibles. 
So what it means is, and this is so important for people who don't know kingdom of God, loving Jesus, people that don't understand there's so many times with all of our heart we treasure and follow God, but our head is splitting apart like we have a migraine and there's a battle in our head. Somebody say amen. And it's good to know that for Mary, she's sitting there saying, I love you, I'm your child, I follow you, but I don't understand why I'm lying in a manure pile. And then next week when we cover when Simeon comes to her and says, a sword's going to pierce your soul, a sword's going to pierce your son's soul, and everybody's going to hate him. How anybody want that prophecy over your child of baby dedication? So Mary followed God with all of her heart, but some things confused her and made her head hurt. You know, I, I, I have so many pastors that they're, they're, they're so concerned about their people, and i got to be honest with you, I haven't been concerned about y'all at all. I, I, I know, I, I've sat with y'all through so many battles and I've seen y'all so many times where your head was splitting apart but your heart was all out for the Lord. And I, I know you're warriors. I know that you fought many powerful battles and won. And, and, and I, haven't, I, I haven't said this to the other pastors, I said it to Beth. I said, you know, pandemic, shmandemic. <laughs> Our people have fought much tougher battles than the pandemic. And I know they're going to beat this battle because they have bigger, beaten bigger battles. Someone say amen. amen. So it helps to know that Mary was head splitting. So I want you to close with four thoughts. Three of them I want you to write down thoughts. Thought number one, when it seems like Herod, the Romans, the census, the pandemic, and the world are all winning and God's people are losing, God always has secret, write down secret plans and smiles. You know, when I've said the pandemic has been the best time of my life, in every service about half of you have smiled and nodded. It's amazing. I thought that there's more stories that have come out of this, of good things that God has done. Number two, from the manger to the shepherds, Jesus' coming shows a different set of write-down values. And that's why it's been the best time of our lives. Because we don't, we don't rock our world by the same clock that they do. Number three, you don't have to write anything, but it's just worth reading. The heavenly hosts were bursting to loudly celebrate the coming of our Savior. The more I see through heaven's perspective, which is what we're going to do when we hold up these candles, the more God's peace will rest on me. Peace to on those to whom his favor rests. And number four, it's about giving birth in a manure pal. Mary didn't understand all that happened, but she remembered, trusted, and watched. And write down the word I. In the same way, I don't understand all you're doing in this pandemic but I remember, I trust, and I watch. Now, before we pray, here's our five questions for next week. Next week, we cover Simeon and Anna, verses 21 through 40. Of course, question's a real easy one, a softball. What's their financial state? The Bible goes real clear into that. Number two is all about Simeon and Anna, and that's a big, profound, layers on layers. You could spend hours on Simeon and Anna and why they're so, so exactly the same on so many levels. Number three, what was Luke's favorite line? In that passage, that's a real easy one. Number four, how did Simeon's horrific five times negative crushing prophecy change the way Mary parented Jesus? That's an interesting one and not an easy one. And number five, what was Jesus like as a child? So as the worship team comes forward and the leaders come forward with your candles and grab your pyro sticks. I want to give you our two prayers that we're going to sort of soak our hearts in as we sing here today. The first prayer is this, Lord, this pandemic is a once-in-a-lifetime event. I want to look back and have a quiet attitude through the birth pains in the manure, but especially to ponder, learn, and grow even when I don't fully understand like Mary. Now, I want to say this one more time. I'm going to read number one. I want you to look at it carefully. Hear me clearly. I'm going to, I'm going to read this, but I'm, don't, don't lie to anything. Just hang on, power people. Just hold your guns. I want, I want you to, and our leaders too, I want you to watch this line. I really believe that in times like this, some of the greatest creativity that ever will come forth will come forth. And so when I say pregnant in a, in a poop pile, I hope that sticks in your head forever. <laughs> but I think a lot of people are pregnant in a poop pile right now. And so I want you to be willing to say amen if Mary can be that way. So I'm going to read it again at the end. I want you, after I say Mary, I want you to say amen. Lord Jesus, this pandemic is a once-in-a-lifetime event. I want to look back and have a quiet attitude through the both birth pains and the manure, 
but especially to ponder, learn, and grow, even when I don't fully understand, like Mary. Can I have an amen? amen? Second, Lord Jesus, I want to be like these shepherds. Throughout Scripture, you reveal heaven to the humbled. Today, I'm going to celebrate the birth of the Messiah, my Lord, and that heaven is open to me. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is let's all stand. Everyone stand, please. Grab your candles with you. And we're going to go ahead and begin to sing, and the leaders are going to light their own candles, and they're going to come around and light your candles. We're going to sing through all three verses, and the third verse, we'll lift our candles together. Let's sing. Jesus, as the shepherds with their visible eyes saw heaven, so with our spiritual eyes, we see heaven opened up. We live only for Jesus. He is our life. He has redeemed us. And heaven is open to us. And we set our eyes not on this fallen, broken world, but on heaven that we will eventually experience. So we live this day for you. You live through us. And we celebrate you with all our heart this day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. Don't forget to take your candles home. <laughs>